Welcome everybody, welcome to the webinar. You've probably seen one of these before. Um, we would like you to share any questions and comments in the Q&A box, please. Don't be shy, you can do that throughout the session. Um, any problems with your connection, just log off and log back in. And if you need any help, please contact program at theconduit.com. Um, so to begin, I'd like to introduce Dr. Annalisa Jenkins, who is our chair of the Conduit Connect. I'm Eva, I manage the Conduit Connect, and Annalisa um, is chair of our board and is a medical doctor by training and has set up her own uh, business, a gene therapy company in the past, which she successfully exited and is now mentor, advisor and investor to a number of fantastic startups. Um, one of them being Mum Incubators, which is a Conduit Connect company. So we're very, very pleased to have James Roberts here today to tell us about Mum Incubators and to um, share some of the exciting innovation. We're now looking at COVID-19 through the lens of innovation and some of the things that in, innovators and entrepreneurs within our own community can do to solve um, and support the crisis. So over to you, Annalisa. Great, thank you, Ava, and uh, good afternoon, early evening on a Friday to everyone. Um, yes, so actually, as uh, Ava has started to introduce, um, of course, it goes without saying that we live in pretty tumultuous and unique times, and um, certainly in the life science and healthcare sector, we're reading a lot about new therapeutics, diagnostics, vaccines, but there are also, and there are also, um, important innovations that are evolving and coming to the fore more broadly across the health system um, to impact uh, the lives of, uh, of people um, that are related to the COVID outbreak and one of which is uh, the care of uh, babies um, and uh, this has become quite an important topic and we'd like to uh, therefore bring back to Conduit um, James the CEO and founder of Mom Incubators is going to tell us a little bit about obviously what Mom is for those of you that haven't come across the company before uh, but also to explain why it's important now for them to be thinking about a significant acceleration uh, change in their business plan and the opportunity that, that presents uh, to uh, investors potentially to get on board with the company um, at this time. So um, let me, without delay, because we've only got half an hour, and please do submit your questions along the way. Um, let me uh, hand over to James and start with the first question, which is, James, why don't you describe um, what is a mom incubator and what inspired you to set up uh, the company? Yeah, well, thanks, Alisa, firstly, and, and uh, nice to meet everybody. Um, thank you for coming here on a, on a Friday afternoon. Uh, so a mom incubator, um, in very basic terms, is a safe, reliable, uh, collapsible incubator that can go anywhere around the world. Um, its original design use was to uh, try and solve uh, one of the largest killers, killers of children under five, which is prematurity. Um, the original idea uh, came out of my university degree. So I'm a product designer by background, and it's what I studied, it's what I really loved. Um, and in my final year, I watched a, a documentary that basically explained uh, that because they lacked this relatively simple piece of equipment, I know that's not as true now, um, they're effectively losing an entire generation. So I thought, okay, is there a way we can deliver these kinds of um, medical devices in small care packages? Um, and then the idea of making it collapsible came to me so it could fit into a really small space. And then the idea for making it um, inflatable um, came to me where you can basically inflate the system up um, to a full size incubator. Um, I then showed that at my degree show and got approached by uh, James Dyson's team, who runs a, an innovation award each year, and they asked if I could enter. I said, of course, I've been following that since I was about 16. Mm -hmm. And uh, amazing thing happened where I actually won it, um, which was incredible. I got a lot of attention from some of the, the, the bigger players around the world. Um, it allowed me to knock down doors. Um, but instead of going with them, I, I started up my own company. Um, and you can see it in the background. This is kind of the results um, of all that work. Um, so this is pretty much fully working now. Um, we're really, really proud of it. Um, so this all collapses down to a small space, weighs less than 20 kilos. You can deliver them anywhere around the world. That's a so, bit more about mom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, um, so obviously um, unique, uh, nothing like this on the market at the moment? 
Nothing like this on the market at the moment. Um, this has taken conventional incubators, which have been the same since the 1950s, and, and thought about them in a completely different way. Um, it was designed from the ground up, and I, I think it was because I, I hadn't, at the time, I didn't have uh, much experience or any experience with medical devices, so I could think about them in a different way. Um, the basic idea came from, okay, what's, the, what's a good insulator of heat, um, air, um, what's relatively uh, cheap to manufacture, you know, inflatables. So that's, that's where, it, where it really came from. And then actually making that into reality, um, there has been a lot of challenges along the way, but, you know, we're able to do it. Yeah. And um, if I'm correct, um, James, um, uh, the normal, uh, as you say, there's been very little disruptive innovation in this space to care for prem babies um, on a global basis. And the traditional uh, incubators, um, how much you know, do people pay for them? And, and what have you assessed as the sort of total pre-COVID, because we're going to come and talk about COVID, um, addressable um, volume rather than market? in this Pre-COVID, let's go. Okay, so there's data saying that the NHS pay on average about £25,000 for an incubator. We're offering um, between three and five for the same, uh, for the same cost. So they can get a much bigger footprint um, with, with our systems. In terms of pre-COVID, um, we were looking mainly at emerging markets. Uh, we've got data showing there's a need for about 460,000 incubators around the world, um, of which uh, 345,000 um, still haven't been um, achieved yet. So there's, there's still a big volume in terms of need for these systems to save children's lives around the world. Yeah, good. Now tell us, I'm going to switch a bit to COVID yep. um, now, So, uh, which is why we're here today, um, because clearly um, you had an original business plan, um, which was going to move through regulatory approval and was going to uh, see the commercial supply of these incubators, both in developed and uh, lower middle income countries in about 18 months, I think, 18 to 24 months. But um, so what's happening right now in the context of COVID and why are you seeing such a surge of interest? Great question. Okay, so the, the last month's been a, a bit of a whirlwind, to be honest. Um, we, it all started with a few inquiries to our website from um, the NHS, um, basically asking if we could supply them with our, with our systems because they're seeing a need in, in capacity and surge. Um, at the same time, our, our clinical team also points out this problem um, or this potential problem in NICU units. Um, we, our clinical team also have um, some input into creating the surge plans for these. Basically what they're um, predicting is that when you have the peaks in COVID uh, or, or COVID related um, illnesses, um, it takes out a lot of the NHS staff. Um, and this has already happened. Uh, and what that means is it closes down birthing units or has the potential to and then children or babies get repatriated to NICU. There's also um, some recommendations that NICU beds are given to COVID patients because of gas lines. Now all of this means the potential for um, a lot of babies out there that need to be placed into safe isolation um, or need incubators. So that was the first part, they just need to increase capacity. The second part was that um, there's new recommendations out showing, stating that um, every COVID-19 positive uh, baby or suspected COVID-19 positive baby should be weaned in an incubator, basically because it's part of the infection control pathway. Um, so, you know, you've seen a lot of those pictures with, I think in Thailand, of children with PPE, um, though they could be in an incubator, um, being protect, protected from uh, some of the virus um, that they could come in contact with. That I think already mothers are being separated from children as well, which is really sad, um, where in theory they could be next to them in, in a system like ours. Um, I think today as well, they came out with any child that um, needs to be moved around the hospital should also be put into an incubator. So that has created a surge of, uh, I guess, interest in what we're doing. Um, and with that interest, we actually went to the, the MHRA, who are, are dealing with all the medical devices at the moment. Um, and much like the, um, the ventilators, um, we, we spoke to them, we got our own project manager and they've given us uh, basically a, a pathway to derogation. What that means is we can get our system used um, in a clinical setting much earlier than, uh, than ever before. Um, we've now put ourselves on, on an accelerated pathway and we're looking to get these systems out into clinical settings in, in June, June time. 
which is um, absolutely incredible. Um, yeah. It's, it's yeah. amazing. It's accelerated our business plan by 12 to 15 months potentially. And then uh, selling in the units is kind of the, the cherry on top of all of that. Yes. And James, um, you know, you mentioned that you had a lot of inbound interest from the uh, neonatal intensive care units, otherwise known as the NICU. Yeah. Um, and so, and then you went, I think, in, and undertook an analysis in just in the UK um, of what the potential uh, spike in demand for capacity might get to in the next 12 months. Perhaps you'd just like to give uh, people a sense of what that looks like. In the UK, um, just from inbound inquiries, uh, we think every each NICU could be between three and ten units. So we were estimated in the UK alone, I think there's about 190, 198 uh, NICUs in the UK, um, level one, two and threes. So we're predicting between um, 100 and 500 units, um, maybe even a thousand. If your recommendations are followed um, for uh, infection control, actually keeping um, babies separate from each other if, if they're COVID positive, um, then that number could be um, multiplied by four. And what this has really done for us as a business is taken a desirable market, um, which before was quite hard to actually put real numbers on and, and made it into a real one. So we can now theoretically see a need for our system in every single NICU in, in the Western world. Um, US, Germany, France, um, for capacity building and for, for isolation. Um, when we take the unit to the hospitals, the, the feedback we're getting back is, is amazing too. They're, they're saying that even if it wasn't for COVID, we'd want these just because we can purchase you know, three of these for the cost of a, a normal incubator and it, it gives them what they need for the child. Um, you know, 90 to 95% of the children are, are, are low, you know, low risk and that's what we're, we're aiming for, just the ones who need that the extra bit of care in emerging markets to life and death. Um, in the UK, it's that extra bit of care so they can, they can grow up better. And you mentioned the um, importance of the regulatory pathway. Um, so perhaps I'll just jump in and say, <laughs> yeah. a background here, um, <laughs> that uh, just to set the context that um, whether it be ventilators, devices, diagnostics, um, and therapeutics, of course, the regulators around the world are selectively trying to prioritize and assess technologies and innovation where they believe that the, uh, the benefits may outweigh the risks of accelerating um, regulatory approval. And so I think it's important to understand that there have been a number of discussions, haven't there, James, between yourselves and our regulatory agency here in the UK, which is a highly respected global agency, on uh, what you would need to do to ensure you have the right quality measures and uh, yeah. the right safety measures in place before you would be uh, supplying these out into the market. So, yeah, you're 100% correct. Um, they're not just giving these to, to anybody. And it, it's still something you have to work with the MHRA to obtain. Um, for, for us, what it means, uh, we're going to be going through, through full safety and performance testing. So effectively at the end of this, we will have um, the incubator. We, we always wanted that is fully, fully tested. Um, at the same time as the MHRA derogation, we'll also be going through uh, the CE marking process of which they're offering expedited review for um, COVID-related COVID -related projects. So the, the main aim um, is that this is 100% um, safe and it performs um, well and effectively. So we're we're not, we're not going to get away with putting anything that is, that is subpar um, onto the market. These are still you know, highly regulated, um, qualified medical yes. devices, and we just happen to be at a good time for that. So you obviously, we saw you at Conduit Connect, and yep. we loved you earlier, and you <laughs> raised money um, to support your base case business plan. And as we've heard now, obviously, uh, that's been significantly accelerated, and the uh, need to scale and perhaps you can speak a little bit about manufacturing of course because I'm sure that will be a question in everyone's mind but tell us now how you know what the, what the priority now is and how you are intending uh, to fund this. The priority now is getting this system done um, as quickly as possible. Um, our developers are already, have already started on this program um, actually and they're already on a very um, accelerated uh, program so that's one part of it the second part is making sure the testing um, 
is lined up and that we've got a good we've got good communication between the test houses the third is ensuring that we have good communication with the um, with the MHRA um, the the extra funding we'll be raising currently um, will be for us to continue along that process and to, to fund the systems actually um, into this year and next year in terms of manufacturing uh, we're using a company called cogent technology they're based in suffolk i believe um, they just got given uh, well they got given a big order for, for ventilators um, but by the time uh, our system needs to be manufactured they will have finished the ventilator ventilator systems and they're all ready to take us um, we've been working with them for, for a while anyway preparing them for, for this um, and they're, they're really kind of you know ready to go on, on creating these systems for us which is which is great um, they're FDA approved as well so great and so um, sort of quantum of the uh, incremental funds that you're now um, thinking that you need to be able to realize this plan to serve the uh, the NICU demand uh, in the next nine to 12 months in the UK and yeah, potentially we're really, other countries. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we're raising um, a million pounds now. I only started on, on Wednesday. Uh, that's when I told our, our current shareholder base and obviously there's there a lot of excitement there. Um, and then I wanted to offer it to you know people who've helped um, the company out, out previously and Conduit have, have done that. Um, and it allows us to get even further with more milestones than we could have ever um, dreamed of, of previously and um, so it, it cuts our funding requirement whilst also you know in, increasing the milestones and it's you know at this time we also um, a few weeks ago we received a, a letter of intent for investments it's, it's quite basic but from a strategic partner um, so that they're the kind of the premier creator of incubators around the world and we just got um, notified that our US patent is is headed for grant so it's a good time yeah <laughs> so everything coming together but, yeah you know you know, if you think about, you know, the vision you had all those years ago, I, I, I should think you could never have imagined that you'd be in this position today. But, but looking forward and beyond the UK, um, what does the mum incubators mean um, for the future globally? Um, I presume that obviously this is a, in some ways, a leapfrogging acceleration of, of, of your vision and the mission of the company. But uh, I also presume that the original passion that you had uh, to serve uh, babies globally remains very much in place. That, that that is the goal of the company. It was always the vision of the company um, to really accelerate access to medical devices. And it's kind of weird that strange that this that COVID has, has done done that for us. Um, this is a a huge problem around the world, and and it's one that deserves solving, deserves products to help. Um, and that's what we were, you know, uh, executing on previously and what we'd raised money on previously. Um, this situation, you know, helps us. It means we can get a Western world quality piece of medical equipment um, out everywhere uh, just because it's, it's thought of differently. In terms of trajectory for the company, um, every system we have is fully, is fully data connected. Um, the issue we're seeing there is once you've got the incubator inside of the the NICU or the place where it's being used, it's actually keeping it working or making sure it's working. And our data card will basically enable us to, to show um, if any system around the world has, has broken down. And with that, we plan to try and solve one of the other problems, which is the equipment graveyard. But that's much, that's kind of a, a big five year plan of, of what the company could be. It's turning, it's going into a much bigger potential market of, of service and maintenance and actually, um, being the first ones to really do that. Yes, I think yeah. that's a very important point. I'm reminded a little bit of jet engines and how people yeah. sit in single locations around the world to ensure that uh, all the engines flying our aeroplanes, or not as, as the case may be at the moment, um, <laughs> are, are, um, are safe and, and are operating well. And I think that that's the technology that uh, you had envisioned uh, to implement uh, within your uh, incubators uh, so that every incubator, whether it be in sub-Saharan Africa, or Latin America, or in a hospital just down the road in, you know, in London, um, could be monitored and serviced remotely uh, yeah. to ensure that as the babies go in and come out uh, that their, their medical device is, uh, is functioning per the specs. And so I think that is, that's another unique attribute of this technology and device, isn't it? 
Yeah, and I, I mean, imagine what you could do with that if you have predictive maintenance data from all around the world and it's effectively creating just-in-time maintenance. Um, it'd be incredible. Um, yeah. And we believe we've got the perfect system to do that because it's been built to be relatively simple, um, easy to repair, easy to maintain. Those attributes are great for any part of the world and we will know if there's anything wrong, um, what exactly it is, and we can send out spare parts and all, all those kind of things. But again, that's very much a, a five-year vision, vision story of where we'd like the company to go. At the moment, we're very focused on let's execute and get these incubators out there and actually helping people. And perhaps I, I, I could ask you, James, as um, I don't have any other questions coming in at the moment, but I could ask you to just reflect a little bit on Conduit Connect and the community and, you know, provide some thoughts as to the benefits or what you've been able to achieve through the uh, collaboration with Conduit Connect. Because, I, you know, there may be people on, on the line here that aren't, haven't traditionally been into that site yet. Yeah. The Conduit Connect was a place where I could ask any question and I'd most likely get a good answer. Um, I know that sounds very basic, but, it, but it's true. I, I could, for example, Annalisa, I, I mean, it was only last week I asked you, hey, I might need some help to find some US manufacturers. First thing you said, oh, oh I've, got a, I've got a place where I could get you the answer. Um, I, think, I think that's the power of that community, um, is that you can literally ask any question you want, and there is most likely someone there who um, will have an answer, will be able to point you to the right person um, who can help solve, solve your problem. I also think it's it's the it's kind of a amalgamation of of the people who see the future of the world. Um, I, I I mean, you call yourself impact investors. We've got mainly impact investors in our company at the moment. Um, I personally believe that impact investing will just be called investing in 10 to 15 years, and every single company will have will have to have an impact charter of what they're doing good in the world. So I just don't think don't think um, people doing bad things is going to be able to. To go ahead anymore in the future. I think everyone's going to have to have a positive impact, is my personal view. Great, thanks James. And obviously uh, we're all very inspired by the next generation of, of young remarkable entrepreneurs with such energy and passion. And um, So I don't see any further questions. I, I, I guess that um, I hope that uh, those of you that have dialed in um, and those of you that will perhaps watch this uh, this recording um, in the coming weeks, I hope, um, will see that uh, you know COVID is obviously uh, catastrophic for so many, uh, but provides also opportunities for people to come together uh, with scientific medical innovations that hopefully will step change care for people in the future. And I hope that what you've seen here today is as we talk about uh, isolation, as we talk about uh, you know, infection control, et cetera, that um, actually there are many opportunities for us to think this through uh, in the future. And one of which is how do we keep uh, babies safe um, and, uh, and well through the coming weeks, months, and probably a couple of years um, mm -hmm. by using these newer technologies. And we all hope that Mon incubators and the work that James and the team are doing uh, will be a, a core central part of that solution. So um, I'd like to thank James um, for coming thank today. Thank you guys for having me on. It's been great. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and uh, if anybody is interested in having a discussion with James and uh, the team uh, to learn more and potentially to uh, provide support, um, then obviously I think you can move through Eva and the team at Conduit Connect and, and make that connection. So. Um, Unless um, Ava has any further points to make. Um, Ava, are you there? Did you want to wrap up this session or shall I? I'm here. Thank you so much, Annalise and James. I, I don't know if you can see me. Um, that was really comprehensive and helpful. And as Annalise has said, we can share the deck and any details on Mom Incubators. They have a full data room and um, and many happy investors who are happy to talk to, to future people who might be interested in joining them on their journey. So thanks very much. We'll be changing the investor deck a little bit um, as well. So <laughs> be good. Keep, keep everyone you. updated. That's okay. great. Thank you very much to everyone who's joined today and uh, enjoy your weekend. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.